question of why move back to Puerto Rico. In the last 10 years, Puerto Rico has experienced financial crisis, political crisis, crises with hurricanes and earthquakes. And on top of all of that, you've got the COVID-19 pandemic. And so they're like, why would you go the opposite way? Everyone's trying to leave. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in Puerto Rico in terms of ministry. A lot of the folks that we minister to just live alone because families have moved onto the mainland and people tend to leave behind some of their most vulnerable family members. It takes their support system away from them. And so one, who I later met as Rosa, sent me a text that said, I live alone, I don't have any food left, please just help me. So I asked, can I call you? and realized that she lived near one of our local pastors. And so he and his wife came here and went to see Rosa and really ministered to her and invited her to church. She agreed and, um, and listened intently to the message and, and then after the service accepted Christ. This is something that God is doing and I get to join him in because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And in gratitude, we respond by serving others. And so that's the importance of giving because that enables us to continue to meet these needs and ensure that the gospel is proclaimed and preached and that churches are planted and that missionaries are sent. Puerto Ricans, they've been through a lot and yet we're gonna do what we need to do to overcome this and we're gonna overcome this together. Good morning, Clear Creek. Glad to be with you this morning. If you would stand with us as we sing the Rock of Ages. standing on the rock today and we're going to join in singing as we're standing on the rock we should be worshiping him and our next song is oh worship the king
So whether it's standing or sitting or coming up to this altar, we pray that you just lay your burdens down. Give them to Jesus today. Father God, you are worthy. God, you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, that you're the author of our life without end. God, that our life does not it does just have to end, Lord, that you give us eternal life and you give us joy and peace and hope and love. God, I just pray that you would just anoint the speaker as he comes today. God, as he gets up to preach from your word and share with us the testimonies you lay upon his heart, it'd be nothing of himself, but God, you'd be glorified. If there's anybody lost who's listening online or in this sanctuary, God, we pray that you just can pick them and fry their hearts with your word. And God, draw them to you today. Today is the day of salvation, God. For those who are just strayed away, God, they would come to you. For those who are not fully trusting in you, God, that they would forgive us where we failed you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today I'm going to introduce our chapel speaker, Steve Holt. He works with the Tennessee Baptist Convention. And I've only known Steve probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years now, something like that. But once we got together, we figured out that when I was a teenager, I served his uh, father. His father was a big-time farmer in our area of Hancock County over in Tennessee. And then uh, my mom and his mother was friends. And when I announced my calling to preach, his mom would pray for me all the time. And so then over the years, we've met at the conventions and different things. We talk a few times a year, and Steve's been a great en encourager to me. Uh, but we figured out that uh, we even have deeper roots. Uh, my great-grandfather, which was the only preacher in my family, uh, Steve's a little older than me, but uh, I, my great-grandfather passed away before I was born. Uh, but he was Steve's first pastor, and he also married his mom and dad. So we have deep roots. But i go ahead and uh, let Steve come on up. Appreciate you, Steve. Well, I appreciate that. It's uh, good to see all of you, and I really appreciate you all uh, making sure that every pew has somebody on it. I always I enjoy that when I look out and see that people really do want it to look like it's full. That's awesome. And for all of you in the back, uh, you probably made a good choice. I do want to say um, I love that sign, too. It says, Chapel ends at 1150. <laughs> Just so you know, and I really appreciate that. And I, I imagine at about 11.45, a red light starts to flash somewhere, like, okay, wrap this up, please. But uh, I do, I appreciate Ryan uh, giving that introduction, and, uh, but, but seriously, his great-grandfather was the first pastor that I ever remember in the little church where I attended when I was growing up. And I remember thinking just as a young person that I wish someday that his, dad, his grandfather's name, we called him Thee, and uh, I wanted Thee to baptize me. And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't the pastor when I got saved, and so another man did baptize me. But I appreciate uh, Ryan, appreciate his family. And I have said this behind his back. I don't know if I've said it to his face, but I say that, Ryan is about as close to a modern-day George Mueller as I've ever met. Now, if you don't know who George Mueller is, you need to Google him, but not right now. <laughs> Wait till after chapel to do it, but you need to know who George Mueller is if you don't know, and I do think Ryan has a lot of the same characteristics. And I, I think that probably uh, people would, would get frustrated for George Mueller for the same reason some people get frustrated with Ryan. And... Uh, I, yeah, I, I get you. Yeah, some of you get that. But um, <clears throat> let me give you a story. This, is a, this actually happened. I didn't make this up. It's not a preacher's story. Several, a few years ago, uh, I, was, I put together a church revitalization conference in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and Ryan came, and Ryan called me and said, hey, I'm coming to your conference. I'm looking forward to it. So he showed up, and uh, I was looking forward to seeing Ryan. I saw him. He was there, and and uh, then the next day, a pastor came up to me and said, I met Ryan last night. I said, you did? Yeah, he's a good guy. I really like him. He said, uh, we got to talking, and I asked him like, uh, about the time the conference was over, I said, well, where are you staying tonight? And Ryan said, I don't know. Now think about that. You know, you know where Murfreesboro, Tennessee is? It ain't close to where he lives. But you all didn't laugh because that made perfect sense to you, right? You just do that too. You just get in your car, you drive that 300 miles, and you'd say, I figure somebody will put me up for the night. Now, I love Jesus. That's a good place for an amen. I love Jesus. <laughs> I love Jesus, and I, I, I trust Jesus. My life verse is trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll make your path straight. Now, I don't take that as literally as Ryan does. <laughs> and that's, that's an indictment on my faith. I understand that. But I'm just telling you, there's no way I'd drive all the way up here thinking, well, you know, figure out something when I get here about where I'm going to stay for the night. But seriously, and, and Ryan will testify, I'm telling you the truth. The old boy looked at you and said, well, you just come stay the night at my house, right? Yeah. 
There you go. So, so there you go. When the Lord tells you to do something, you do it, okay? That's, then that's why you need to look up George Mueller, just so you know. But, uh, but I do appreciate Ryan. And I always love catching up with him. It's always good to catch up with him because he's telling me all these things that the Lord is doing in his life. And, and it does kind of make me feel bad about myself. And then I get over it. But, you know, I have to, I have to go back and, and redo it again. But um, So I, I appreciate the invitation to be here. So when I was in college years ago, uh, we had our, our Old Testament professor, I'll never forget, he would open up class for the first, first class in whatever class you had, he'd do the same thing. He'd spend about half of the period talking about himself because he wanted you to understand a little bit about him. He wanted you to know where he came from because he really did want to take an interest in you and, and he wanted to make an investment in you and so he wanted you to know where he came from. And he would, he would quote uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, a poet from a previous century, who said at some point, uh, forgive me for talking so much about myself, but there's no one I know so well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself on the front end, then I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Lord has, has put on my heart, but all of it is tied together. So this is what I call a stream of consciousness sermon. So uh, you just have to kind of just hang on. The guys asked in the booth, I need to, need to put any scripture on the screen. I said, no, but we are going to look at some scripture as I go along. But I'll just, you know, I hope you all can access uh, your copy of God's Word either on your phone or in your Bible. And, and that, that, I prefer that to showing it to you on the screen anyway. But um, today is my birthday. Thank you. That was the pregnant pause. You all got, you're all passed. I mean, this is, this is becoming a test, and you all are doing well. So today is my birthday. This is the last birthday that I will have that starts with a five. So you figure the rest of it out. And uh, so this is, this is my birthday. I was born in 1963, and uh, so I've, I've been on this earth a while. But for 51 years, I've been a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, so for 51 years, longer than just about everybody in this room has been alive, I've been a Christian. And for 43 of those years, I've, been, uh, I've surrendered my life to, to, to being a, a minister of the gospel, 43 years. And for over 35 of those years, I've been a vocational pastor and now a denominational uh, servant as well. So for, for a long time, I've been on this road. And uh, I... I, I want to share with you for just the next few minutes, and I don't think that the uh, flashing red light's going to catch me, but uh, I just want to share just a little bit about my journey and things that the Lord has taught me. And most of you uh, are in school because you feel like God's placed a special calling on your life. You may or may not know what that is. Uh, when I was 16 years old and God uh, spoke to me, I, I remember where I was, I remember uh, what was going on in my life, and I did not hear God's audible voice, but it was as clear to me as if He was sitting in, next to me, and I knew that He was calling me to ministry. Now, as a 16-year-old in Hancock County, Tennessee, that only meant one thing. I was supposed to preach, right? You, you got to preach. And so uh, the next Sunday night at my church, uh, I... I we, we came around the altar to pray, and, and the pastor said, uh, has anybody got anything on their heart? Well, I said, I've got something on my heart. God's called me to preach. And uh, we prayed, and then some people came up to sing, and I sat down on the front row where Ryan would be, and the pastor came and sat next to me. He said, well, if God's called you to preach, you might as well start tonight. So I preached my first sermon uh, that night. And uh, the, the next Sunday, uh, we went to a little... Uh, primitive Baptist church that my mom uh, had grown up in and it was union meeting and if you know anything about a union meeting you have this week of, of preacher fest where you have three or four preachers a night and then on Sunday you have four you know three or four preachers that morning and uh, the pastor of that church said hey, we've got this uh, young boy that's just announced his call to preach and we want him to come and preach for us and so I got up there and I gave him the best 10 minutes I had and uh, I thought I did pretty good. Uh, but the pastor, I noticed when he got back up, he said, uh, well, I've seen him start at the top, and I've seen him start at the bottom. 
Do you know I found out something? He said, them that start out on top seems like they don't last long. They fizzle out. Don't make much. But I believe this brother here is going to be with us for a long time. <laughs> That's not exactly what I wanted him to, uh, I thought he would say. But uh, about 20 years after that, he would have been in his 80s at this point, I saw him at a funeral, and I went up to him, and his name was Carl, and I said, Brother Carl, you don't remember me, but you were a prophet, and you just didn't know it. And he said, what are you talking about? And I just told him the story I just told you, and I said, the Lord's still using me, and I'm still preaching. Probably not much better than I was when you heard me the first time, but I'm still trying to, to make my best effort at it. But... Here's, here's some things that I've learned, and I, I have uh, I've been educated far beyond my intelligence. I've attended conferences. I've gone to all kinds of trainings. I, I can't tell you how many sermons I've listened to, how many, how many meetings I've been in, what, uh, all of the different experiences I've had as a pastor, as a denominational worker, uh, as a believer. But for me, my faith and my walk with the Lord and my ministry over those decades has not gotten more complicated. It's gotten far more simple to the point where I can tell you that there's very few things that I am I'm absolutely convinced of. And I think that if just by putting more emphasis on these few things that I'm going to share with you this morning, uh, if, I had, if I had had that perspective in my 20s, I would be a, a different person today. But first of all, and I'm going to read uh, one, pa- one verse of Scripture from the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in the New Testament. So my Old Testament Scripture, and, and the reason I'm reading this is because when, when we were talking about me coming and speaking at chapel, I, I literally put this verse in the notes. Uh, I didn't realize at the time that, that what I would be preaching, but I did put this verse in the notes. This is... Uh, Psalm 127, verse 1, many of you will be familiar with this verse of Scripture, says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I don't know what that verse says to you, but here's what it says to me. Nothing works the way it's supposed to without the Lord when it comes to the things of the church. Nothing works, and one of my favorite old hymns is, Brethren, We've Met to Worship, and my favorite line in that hymn says, All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Uh, As I was driving over here, coming across Clinch Mountain, I was talking to a director of missions, and he was talking about a sermon he preached on Jehoshaphat. You know the scripture where he's surrounded by his enemies. They're going to come, and they're outnumbered, and they all pray, and he says, Lord, uh, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's a pretty good way to, to face the un, unfaceable. That's a good way to face the, the unconquerable uh, obstacles that, that life puts before you. Lord, I don't know what to do, but I got my eyes on you. And I'm trusting you to give me what I need. And I, I want you to know that uh, as, as someone who is in his sixth decade of following Jesus, the thing that's more true in my life today than ever before is I absolutely have to depend on the Lord. And I don't do that because I have to. I do it because I know that's the best way to go. Trust the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge Him. Now, I'm not where Ryan is. I don't, I don't make, uh, you know, unless the Lord specifically told me, don't get a hotel, which He hadn't done. I'm not, I may not be there, but I'll tell you where I am. I don't worry as much about what tomorrow's going to bring because I know the, who holds the future. And I know that He's going to take care of me. Paul says, I know who I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The sooner you work that out in your mind, because there was a time that I had that up here. I mean, that, that, that's Bible, right? There's no way you can read God's word and not come to the, the conclusion that God is sovereign. He made everything that exists and everything is held together by him. So he is sovereign. But the sooner you get that up here and get it down here, that's where it needs to be, to the point where it's not just what you believe in your head, it's what you know in your heart. The only way that you'll get there is if you trust the Lord and lean into Him and you see Him do the things that only God could do. 
And when you see that, the more you're able to lean into Him. So the first thing that I would want to say to you about my journey and and what the Lord has taught me over those years is trust Him. Have absolute dependence on Him. Now, many of you have done that. Many of you have moved. You've you've made choices in your life based on what you believe God is telling you to do, and you didn't know how it was going to work out, right? How many times have you had a chapel speaker or you've had somebody uh, come to your church and they talk about these miraculous things that God did in their life? Well, the reason they had those miraculous things happen is because they took the first step. Hello? If God says do something... That may be your your step toward Him that leads to what God wants to do in your life. But until you take that first step, it's not going to happen. When the Hebrew children came to the Jordan River and they had the Ark of the Covenant, what did those priests have to do before they could cross over on dry land? They had to step out into the water, didn't they? They had to make that first step, and when that happened, then the water rolled back, and so they walked across on dry land. What they said, Lord, you do your part first. You do what you, you, you show us something first. That's not faith, is it? Not biblical faith. That's a show me kind of faith. But absolute dependence on God. Now, the final thing uh, that I want to talk about is how to uncomplicate your ministry. Um, I, I wanted to know everything I could know about ministry. I wanted to be, I wanted to have the cutting edge church. I wanted to have, I wanted to be the guy that people say, wow, he's got it going on. He knows how, what he's doing. And, and, uh, you had the, had the real, you know, well, you know, the ministries that everybody wanted to be a part of. But again, uh, six de- in my sixth decade of being a believer, in my fourth decade, fifth decade of ministry, in my fourth decade of, of vocational ministry, here's what I know. Jesus got it right with the Great Commission. Amen? Jesus got it right with the Great Commission. So one of the things that I do is help churches with strategic planning and, and visioning and all that. But here's what, you, when you do that, you really want to make sure they can answer three questions. Every church needs to be able to answer three questions. Why are we here? Which talks about your mission. What's your purpose? Second question is, what's important to us? And I didn't really ask that question early in ministry, but I've really come to understand until people, you, a church truly understands what their actual core values, what are their behaviors, what are their key things that are important to them, until they understand what those are, you can't really do much with them. Because how many times, and some of you have been around for a while, how many times have you seen churches destroyed over people's preferences because those behaviors dictated what they thought church was all about? So you have to understand what your values are, and then you have to, measure, you have to be able to compare the actual values of a church to the, the, the values that you see uh, given in Scripture and what really should be important to us, which is, comes out of our purpose. And then finally, where are we going? Where's God taking us? You've got to understand that. What, where's God, what's the trajectory for your church? But I want to talk about that purpose. For me, if you look at what a, purpose, a true purpose of a church is, it's just some, going to be a simple restatement some way, somehow, of the Great Commission. Because when you go to the Great Commission, you know it. Uh, it's probably pasted on the wall somewhere around here. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's it. Why are we here? Why does the church exist? To make disciples. That's why we're here. If all God was interested in when He saved you was making sure you went to heaven when you die, the best thing He could have done is knock you in the head, then took you on with Him. But He's got you here on purpose, right? Hello? Hello? You're here on purpose. God has, has a purpose in your life. That's why you're here. That's why you're in school. That's why you're, you're, you're doing whatever ministry you're involved in because God has something He wants to do. What is that? He wants to use you in, in redeeming a lost world to Himself. How do we do that? By making disciples. By making disciples. How do you make a disciple? Well, you got to get lost people saved first, right? you got to get lost people saved. So for me, this is what it is. We want to see lost people saved, we want to see saved people discipled, and we want to see discipled people mobilized to multiply. So that's it. 
If, and if I w- w- were to go back, if I were to go back, then, then that's where I would want to put my focus as a pastor, as a staff member, as a believer. It's where I want the remainder of my life. That's, all, that's going to be my one-shot deal. Whenever somebody says, well, come and lead us, here's what we're going, I'm going to lead you to do. See, lost people saved, saved people discipled, and discipled people mobilized to multiply. Because that is the fulfillment of Jesus' great commission. So let's talk just a little bit about that. I want just a few things I'll say about each one of those. You know that the best thing that ever happened to anybody is, a fact, is when Jesus Christ comes to be Lord of their life. I was seven years old. I was in a, a, a little church. It, was, it, wasn't, it may have been this big, one room. Our, our uh, bathrooms were outside, and they, they didn't have any uh, plumbing. Uh, but... I heard the truth of the gospel. We already made, I've already made reference to the fact that uh, Ryan's great-grandfather was my first pastor who preached the gospel. And the gospel was that Jesus Christ came to this earth and He died on the cross for my sin. He rose on the third day for my redemption and He is now seated at the Father making intercession. And now because of His sacrifice, I could have eternal life. And I didn't know much as a seven-year-old boy, but I knew that was a pretty good deal. Now, here's the other thing that I knew, and I, and I really appreciated this. It made a difference in people's lives. You get that? Jesus made a difference in people's lives because they testified to the difference that Jesus made in their life, and they demonstrated the difference Jesus made in their life. How are we going to get lost people saved? They're going to have to see a difference that Jesus makes in our life. And we got to verbally give a witness, but the best witness we ever had is our testimony. That Jesus has changed my life. I tell people all the time, I am a satisfied customer. Amen? (laughs) I I got a dose and it made a difference in my life. And I wouldn't take anything for what I have in Jesus Christ. I wouldn't take anything for the hope that I have in Him. I wouldn't take anything for the difference that He made in my life. And so I want to see other people come to know Jesus the way I know because I'm telling you, it made an exponential difference in my life. The trajectory of my life is totally different than it would have been had I never come to know Jesus Christ. So we want to see lost people saved. That's the Great Commission. The best thing that ever happened to anyone, whether they be uh, rich, poor, whatever race, whatever language they speak, the best thing that ever happened to anybody on the face of the earth is when they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you're not convinced of that, we need to talk. That's worth giving your life for. There are people all over the world who are, who are laying down their life because they believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was the best thing that ever happened to them and they believe people ought to know about it. So we want to see lost people saved. And then we want to see saved people discipled. You see, the second part of the Great Commission there is teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. So what Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's one thing get somebody across the line, right? We want to get them justified, but then we got to get them sanctified. we got to get them to the place where they understand what they have in Jesus. Now, one of, now, some of you have never seen the Beverly Hillbillies, but there's about a handful of people that know what the Beverly Hillbillies is all about. I love that show. I watched that show growing up, and the thing that really, the whole premise of the show is the fact that these people live in this mansion, but they never figured out that they left the log cabin. So all these modern conveniences didn't mean anything to them. Even though every time that you go, they have a, a shot of the kitchen, there's a brand new washer and dryer right there. But whenever they wash their clothes, it's out by the, sweat, the, fence, or the cement pond, and Granny's washing her clothes in a pot, right? Now, my favorite room in the whole house was the, uh, the billiard room. And the billiards were all those animals hanging on the wall, right? And then there was this big table that had a green tablecloth on it, and then there were these pot passers, and it was the fancy eating table. So what? So, the, so that's the joke, right? The joke is these people just don't know what they got. Well, that's the joke on believers. We don't know what we've got, and we need to learn all the riches of God's grace and mercy and His provision for us 
if we will but do some of the stuff that I was joking about earlier, right? Trust the Lord. Lean not on your own, own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll make your path straight. But the joke is on us because we think it's all about us, right? One of the most haunting verses of Scripture in the Bible for me is the verse in Judges where Samson wakes up thinking he's still Samson, right? And he's tied up. He doesn't know. He hadn't figured out, I don't think yet, that he's bald. And the Scripture says he thought he would break these bonds just like he'd done all the other times, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. You know, when the Lord leaves you, when you think you've got it figured out, when you think you, got, you don't need the Lord and you'll, you'll do it in your own strength and your own power, all of a sudden God just removes His, removes His power and protection from you and le leaves you sometimes your own devices. That's called the Lord's discipline. And whom the Lord disciplines, He, he chastens, and He disciplines everyone that's a son. So God's going to allow things to happen in your life sometimes because you think you got this covered and you don't realize you don't have anything covered. So people need to be discipled. People need, they, we need to invest in believers just as much as we invest in lost people because they need to learn what it means to walk with the Lord. We need discipled people. Most people who are in our church, I don't think they've ever truly come to understand everything that they have in Christ Jesus. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost 60 years old and I'm telling you, I'm finding out all the time there are things that I have not truly taken advantage of as a believer. And I've been a believer longer than I've been alive, almost as long as I've been alive. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, this is, this is the reality. Somehow Satan has convinced us that churches need to be about one, of two, one or two things, right? We, we need to be either strongly evangelistic and we need to see people saved so we can get them baptized and we can do that. Or there are those that say, well, we just want to go deeper with the Lord. Nobody's ever, it seems like there's very few churches ever figured out that's two sides of the same coin. It's one thing to see people cross the line to salvation and become justified. It's another thing entirely to say, we want you to truly understand all the benefits that are yours because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So we need to see saved people disciple. Now here's the third thing, and I'm, I'll take just, just a word or two on this because this is the key for me. This is why I'm a Southern Baptist. You know, Baptists, I, I, I have these calls. I'm the guy that they, whenever somebody asks a hard question at the, at the lady that answers the phone, they send them to me. That's a blessing. Let me tell you. So like lady yesterday, my pastor's doing, I won't go into all the details what the, her pastor's doing, and in her opinion, it's just wrong. And when people call the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board with a complaint like that, you know what they want us to do? They want us to fix it. And I have to go into all this long explanation about Baptist polity, the fact that we're not hierarchical and we, you know, every church is autonomous and we can't really do anything unless we're invited to come in and give counsel. And that's never satisfactory for anybody. One day, a guy that was kind of like me one time, he was, a, he was in a similar kind of role. This guy calls and he says, I'll tell you what, our, our church is torn all to pieces and pastor's gone crazy, he's gone off the deep end and people are leaving right and left, you need to come and do something about this. And, and the guy told him what I told the lady yesterday, you know, that's not really what we do. We're, your church is autonomous. We can come in if you, if you invite me in, but I can't really do anything. And they said there was this long pause on the other end of the line. And finally, the guy said, you mean to tell me we send all that money down there to you fellas and you can't do nothing. And then the guy said, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. You got that right when it comes to stuff like this. But, but here's why I'm Southern Baptist. That was a long, I mean, I'm almost at the flashing red light, I'm afraid. But here's why that's important. How, why I'm a Southern Baptist? Because I believe that disciple people need to be mobilized to multiply. And the, the genius of our cooperative connection as autonomous churches 
in the Southern Baptist Convention, in the KBC, the TBC, and all, and all of the local associations is that the idea that we can do more together than we can by ourselves. You'll have people coming in and, off, in and out of this campus for here throughout the summer, right? Most of them will be Southern Baptist. Some of them won't be. But they come because they want to do ministry. They want, they, want to, they want to do ministry. They want to give their people an opportunity to do ministry. They want to have an opportunity to go and, and share their faith and, and, and minister. That's what I'm talking about. You see, Jesus intends for his kingdom to expand by multiplication, not just addition. And how do you multiply? Well, you multiply when you get people who are, are believers who then are discipled so that then they can go out and do the work of ministry. And your efforts individually become part of a collective whole that then changes the world. That's why we're here. That's how we got here. Because people believed what the old gospel song says, little is much if God is in it. And so when I do my part along with other brothers and sisters in Christ, God just does amazing things. And my little part is a part of something that God wants to do. I believe in mobilization. I believe that as we mobilize through uh, mission efforts, as we mobilize in, com in local communities, the whole a Acts 1-8 strategy, I believe in that with all of my heart. That's why you're here. You believe in that too. So in conclusion... That's where you usually you need to, if you don't do an amen when the pastor says in conclusion, woe be unto you, you ought to preach 15 more minutes. But uh, in conclusion, let me just say, these are the things that I have learned. Here's where, and that's where I want to spend the remainder of my time on this earth before I go to be with Jesus or he comes to get me, get all of us. Here's where I want to spend my time. I want to believe and trust him more. I used to sing that. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. That's where I want to be. I want to have a greater dependence on the Lord. The other part of it is I want to be an instrument, a catalyst. A catalyst is a, is a it, it speeds up a process. So I just want to be a catalyst to see more people saved save people discipled, and disciple people mobilized to multiply. That's why I'm here today. That's why I came here, not just because Ryan promised to take me over here to Moorhaw. Is it Moorhaw you're going to feed me? Kellyhaw, Kellyhaw, that's right. I've eaten there before, and I came back anyway. But uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, not, not until after I eat, though, right? It's probably a different cook. That was 20 years ago. I'll just, I'll just say that. I'll, I'll give that disclaimer. But, uh, but here's what I want, I want to say, and I'll, I'll, I will pray and I'll be done. Trust the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And whatever you do, when he says go, go. When he says stay, stay. When he says pray, pray. And whatever he says, your answer is what? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for these good people. I pray, Lord, your blessings on them in their lives. I thank you, God, for their commitment to you, commitment to be a part of your kingdom and a part of uh, what you're doing in this world. And I ask, God, that you would continue to lead God and direct this school, that you would continue to lead God and direct its faculty, its students. And, Lord, may the impact of Clear Creek multiply in days to come and continue to be effective until Jesus returns. And more than anything else, Father, we just want to say yes. So lead us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.